Hello, welcome to Spirit Talk. My name's Jean Ramsiati. We've all heard a lot about the religious right and the secular left in religion, but have you heard much about liberal Christians? Well, today we're going to dig into that subject, and I have with me a person who wrote a book about liberal Christianity. I'd like to welcome Reverend Scotty McLennan. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Jen. Great to be here. <laughs> so, Scotty, so you're the um, Dean for Religious Life at Stanford University for nine years, right? It's been nine years. Yeah. So now, what did you do before that? I was at Tufts University as the university chaplain, and that was I was in my 17th year when I left Tufts. So that was a wonderful run. And before that, I practiced law in a low-end com community in Boston under church sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So oh it's a, called a legal ministry. A legal ministry, right. my goodness. So there was about a decade of law practice and then more than a decade and a half at, at Tufts and almost a decade now at Stanford. So now, f first of all, so now, have you yourself been a liberal all your life? Uh, no, actually. Interesting. Oh. I, I grew up as quite a conservative Republican in the Midwest. Uh, my uncle was Barry Goldwater's campaign manager in oh 1964 God. in Arizona. And I was very much a supporter of Goldwater. I was a conservative Christian, a conservative Protestant Presbyterian Christian. So you know, I've gone through the 60s, and that had a lot of impact on me. <laughs> well, whatever inspired you to be crazy enough to write a book about liberal Christians, and oh, Jesus, especially about Jesus. Jesus was a liberal, yes. You believe that with all your heart and soul, right? I do, but the book really is trying to build bridges between conservative Christians and liberals on the one hand, and between liberal Christians and liberals politically, mm -hmm. the atheists who, many people use the word liberal as if it means non-religious. So Definitely. I'm trying to build bridges in both directions, and I'm also trying to save the word liberal, which I think has come on very hard times. You won't find many liberal politicians willing to use the word. You won't find many liberal religionists willing to use the word. They like to use words like progressive or in the religious world mainline or some other word other than liberal mm -hmm. but conservatives enjoy using the word liberal and they <laughs> use it very pejoratively Pounding the you know, <laughs> I counted 14 times that Mitt Romney used the word liberal pejoratively in his convention oh speech gosh. so it's an important word historically it needs to be mm -hmm. saved because you said it goes back in history right it really does if you look up years. if you look up the word liberal li a political liberal actually in the Encyclopedia Britannica, it says that political liberalism is rooted in the Greek philosophers, mm -hmm. the Hebrew prophets, and Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. So even what we now think of as political liberalism has those, those kinds of philosophical and religious roots. My gosh, now, now what were just a few points of why, why you think Jesus was a liberal? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, he was not a biblical literalist. He spoke very cleverly, often using parables and stories which challenged his religious authorities in his day. He would break one of the Ten, ten Commandments if That's need right. be. That's right. For example, letting his disciples glean in the fields when they were hungry on the Sabbath or healing himself on the Sabbath. He was also a, a he challenged the religious authority of his day. He was concerned about freedom from religious authority. So freedom, mm -hmm. rationality. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I believe, was, was very much of a, of a rationalist mm -hmm. in the way he spoke and challenged those religious authorities. He was tolerant. He was open to people, whether they were Roman tax collectors or soldiers, prostitutes, lepers, even the most hated foreigners, not of his own tradition, like the Samaritans. Yeah. We use that word positively these days, mm -hmm. but it was very much of a negative word in his day. So when he was asked, who is the neighbor? that one should love, he, gave, he told us a story not about his own religious authorities who failed to stop for the bloodied person on the road to Jericho, but he turned to the foreigner, the hated foreigner, somebody of another religious tradition. So he was tolerant as well. Mm -hmm. And he also had a very progressive vision of the future. He was always orienting towards the future. He said, you've heard of old, but I tell you, not eye for an eye, mm -hmm. but turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. Or don't just love your your neighbor, but love your enemy. 
Yeah, he, he had no prejudice and no bigotry. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so I think that's, that's really <laughs> very, very important because he's often seen, or his followers are often seen as quite bigoted and narrow-minded mm -hmm. and limited. So I also want people who are not Christian, who think of Christianity in those very na narrow, bigoted forms, who see it not only as intolerant, but as warmongering and as a, a very, uh, very much oriented towards the rich, not the poor, and so on. I want them to understand who Jesus truly was. Yeah, and, and that point you said about uh, not a literalist, that's, that's a big difference between fundamentalists and... Uh, what would you say? L liberals. Liberals. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, yeah, gonna use that word progressive. progressive. Well, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. <laughs> progressive. But that, I mean, th that's what well, I'm. I happen to be Catholic, and that's one of the difference between the Catholic Church and uh, some of the other Protestant religions. Is you know, we we aren't literalists. Mm -hmm. We don't think that the Bible is the word of God. Right. We think it's the inspired word of God. Exactly. And actually, for most of Christian history, that's what all Christians thought, was that this is the word of inspired people telling about their relationships with the divine mm -hmm. rather than the literal word of God. The literal word of God is Jesus. That's God made flesh. Right. Now, did you answer that again for me, why you wrote the book again? <laughs> 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 There's many other reasons why you wrote the book, right? right. Well, the main reason is that I've, was, I've been very frustrated seeing liberals have to lay low and not feel that they have a voice because the only voices seem to be the religious right or there's a lot of, of atheist books out on the market now which say religion is a delusion, God is a delusion, God is not oh, yeah, great, yeah, yeah. Uh, the end of faith, et cetera, by people like Christopher Hitchens mm -hmm. and um, Sam Harris, who's actually a graduate of Stanford, and uh, Richard Dawkins. Dan Dennett, and I know uh, some of them. Dan Dennett and I were uh, together at, at Tufts for 17 years. He mm. was <laughs> in the philosophy department and when I was the all, university chaplain. <laughs> so. and, I've, and a lot of them were on campus, have been on campus at Stanford in the last year. Well, would you want to show your book, the cover, and I'll read this, uh, this quote on the cover by Gary Trudeau, who is the author of Doonesbury, and then you can tell me about your friendship with Gary. So Gary Trudeau says, this book is a timely and powerfully reasoned argument that it's time for liberals to reclaim ownership of Christ as he was, an outlier, a passionate but rationalist revolutionary who spoke to the best in us. That's a great quote. So I remember you were roommates with Gary Trudeau, right? I was. You know, in college at Yale between 1966 and 1970, we were roommates. When you go to college these days, they ask you questions about whether you smoke or whether you stay up late at night, and they try to mix, make sure they get roommates together who are compatible. But they didn't ask us in those days whether we wanted to room with a cartoonist who might <laughs> use his roommates later in life as fodder for his cartoon strip. So Gary has put his roommates, one of my, my friends and, and another of our roommates is Charlie Pillsbury whose nickname from high school through college was The Dune. So they took his nickname, Dune, Derek Gary did Dune, and put it together with half of his last name, Pillsbury. And so <laughs> Dunesbury is really Charlie Pillsbury. Oh, yeah. And there's a Reverend Scott Sloan and that's character. You. The red, red hair, haired, red, red beard. Hair. <laughs> about 30 years ago, I had red hair and red beard. And that was that. But also, it's a character that includes William Sloan Coffin, who was our chaplain when we were undergraduates at yeah. Yale, who was a civil rights activist, an anti-war activist, oh. and really a very effective university chaplain. So I'm so, proud to be associated okay, so with Okay, so you're still in touch with, with Trudeau? Oh, yes. Okay. We, we actually, this roommate group, seven of us, get together every year in, on an island in the, off the coast of Connecticut. <laughs> with our spouses and our children, and we've done that now for 25 oh, years, fine. so it's really oh, terrific. And oh, we so see you each still other have you in the cartoon or not? Yep. That, Every once in a while. That with Reverend the red Scott, hair? about a week a year. Is he going to keep you with the red hair? And it's in blazing color. If, it's, yeah, if you see it on a Sunday, you can see the red hair. So, but, uh, so you haven't aged in the cartoon now. Huh? Funny thing. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but the only downside, of course, that is, uh, is being a lifelong joke oh. when, you're, <laughs> when you're a cartoon character. Now, there's, uh, you, you repeat these four points in the book often, so, right. so what are they? That, that, that's a, your theology, right? Yes, and I, I think, I, I claim it's Jesus' theology, oh, you, okay. Would that, you? that he really was a progressive in the sense of looking to the future. So when you, t so when you say liberal, mm. you mean 
somebody who looks to the future, not to the past. Mm -hmm. He was tolerant and open to people of all kinds. And the word liberal means, if you look it up in the dictionary, beneficent, mm -hmm. beneficent, yeah. uh, open, mm -hmm. tolerant, caring, understanding, and so on. If you say, would you like a liberal heap, uh, you know, a heap of potatoes here, you know, <laughs> which means a lot, a ample, a, an abundance, mm -hmm. and so on. So that, it's a positive word in that sense. Jesus also used logical, rational ways of thinking. I don't believe that Jesus was a, um, a supernaturalist in the sense of believing that the laws of nature will be broken. Instead, he said when he was tempted in the desert early in his ministry to go up on the top of the Tower of Jerusalem and throw himself off, he said, you know, do not test the Lord thy God. And I see an, a line under there, do not test the law of gravity, because uh, that's, yeah. that's the miracle of life to me, and the miracle that Jesus, I believe, saw, which is that life holds, it makes sense. And with modern scientific method, we have the faith that it's not gravity today, and not gra and, uh, gravity today but not gravity tomorrow. It's consistent natural law. And actually, the Roman Catholic tradition is very good on that, it takes natural law very seriously. And I think we Protestants often have deviated from that basic understanding of the importance of natural law. So are you happy to be a Christian? Or were you ever tempted to, you know, ditch it? I think you did spend some time in India, didn't I, you? I was, I not only was tempted to ditch it, I did ditch it. I, uh, coming out of high school, I came to college as an atheist because I couldn't mm -hmm. understand how a just and loving God mm -hmm. could allow all the horrible things that go on in the world. Some of that, obviously, is what people do to people. So mm -hmm. that's understandable in terms yeah, of I our like free will. Yeah, I into in the book about that. But the acts of God, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the tsunamis that kill innocent children, I just couldn't understand how a just and loving God could let that happen. So I came to, to college as an atheist, and it was my university chaplain, William Sloan Coffin, who had a seminar for friendly disbelievers, oh, which I is like what that. I considered myself. And he wrote a book kind of like that, didn't he? He did, actually. Yes, he wrote a book which was, the, it were conversations to a, to a young doubter, conversations with a young doubter. That's not quite the title, but the, mm -hmm. the words young doubter w was in the title. Well, and well, you were fortunate to have uh, absolutely. meet him. And that book really includes a lot of what he said oh, to us yeah. during that freshman year. So he opened me up to a much more liberal view of Christianity mm -hmm. and also to other world religions. And I ended up going to India mm -hmm. the summer after my freshman year in college. And that was a very powerful experience. Lived with a Hindu Brahmin priest. He knew the Bible better than I did. He knew the Quran. He knew the, the Buddhist scriptures. Hey, talk so, about the avatar. Yes. He was an avatar. And well, his, his avatar was Ramakrishna, who was a 19th century uh, uh -huh. Hindu uh, uh, saint. Mm -hmm. And Ramak uh, Ramakrishna's disciples was Vivekananda, who was at the 1893 world mm -hmm. religions mm -hmm. parliament in Chicago and sort of took the Western world by storm. We learned about Hinduism at that time in a way we'd never known of, known of it before. But Ramakrishna said, and my, my priest said, you should stay with the religion that you grew up in because all the religions have avatars. Avatars mm -hmm. now has a new meaning. But it used to mean incarnation of God. Oh, okay. So, I, the, I mean, now with computer avatars, uh, it's a different. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> probably going to be a car named Avatar. Yeah. So. so we need we need a different <laughs> word. But incarnation, he he would say, f that Krishna was Krishna and Ramakrishna were incarnations of God. The Buddha, Jesus, and there've been a number of incarnations of God. And he said, go back to America and be the best Christian you can be if you want to be a Hindu. Mm. And what? How does that work? <laughs> and uh, especially since I grew up in an environment which would have condemned him for knowing about Jesus, but not mm -hmm. uniquely mm -hmm. taking him on as his Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. But he said, figure out a way to go back and be an open Christian, uh, not a... Very wise, uh, wise, wise person. Uh, now, another um, thing you build, uh, about writing the book was building bridges be right. between not just the other traditions, but like you said, the atheists, the non-believers, the right. disenchanted, and I like what, um, like you, what you talk about atheists, like Hutchins, like you, really think that he is a spiritual person. He well, just isn't a monotheist, right. right? Well, Christopher Hitchens is pretty tough in his book. God is not <laughs> great, yes. but I think Richard Dawkins is in his book, The God Delusion, oh. where he has kind things to say about what he calls Einsteinian religion, which is religion not 
following a personal God, but more of an impersonal God, a sense of power in the universe, order in the universe, a sense that things do hold together. So he was kinder on the kind of religion that's closer to my own soul, which I think is a more impersonal form okay. of religion. On the other hand, I see the wonder of Jesus to be that he was a person filled with the Spirit of God and teaches us how to live in a, in a fully divine way. So to follow in Jesus' footsteps, I think, is to come closer to our own soul and to the spirit of the universe. And other religions, traditions would say to the Dharma or to the Tao, or Confucius would say to the Li, to, the, to that law that really uh, is the law of the universe that we need to align ourselves with. And in the Christian tradition, Martin Luther King Jr. used to talk about the law of love. And so I yeah. think that's the human dimension of it, the law of love and the great unique contribution of Christianity is this notion of love, yeah. radical love. I learned so much about Martin Luther King in your book. <laughs> wow, he was really a mystic, right? He was. He was. Very he was. And we often just think of him as a civil I rights know. leader now. We forget that he was a minister, that he was very engaged in a commitment to nonviolence that wasn't just a pragmatic commitment to mm -hmm. nonviolence, but a very spiritual commitment, because that's what he believed the law of love required. And then uh, you move towards your book and uh, you go, do you talk about that maybe an ideal would be a world religion, mm. one world religion? Right. It's, uh, uh, I had a professor a, in Divinity School. A great School. idea, yeah. <laughs> if it would w work. Well, well, he had, this is Wilfred Cantwell Smith was his name. Yeah. And he wrote a book called Towards a World Theology. Okay. Well, yeah. And he didn't think that there should be one religion that we all ascribe to but he felt that if we would deepen our understanding of our own traditions, be fully Muslim, be fully Christian, Jewish, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. we would understand that faith itself is a human universal. It just comes in different forms. Mm -hmm. That all of us have experienced, maybe not all of us, most of us have experienced love. So we can talk about love as a human universal, but it comes in a lot of different forms. Romantic. And um, there's a lot friends, of misunderstanding. A, a lot of misunderstanding. And ignorance about it. And the same with, with faith. That faith comes in many different forms and it comes in Muslim and Jewish and Christian forms. It comes in a humanist form, which you might call an atheist form. So there's, or scientific form. There are many different ways to talk about faith. So now, um, as far as the interfaith angle, like what's happening at Stanford, I'm, they're so lucky to have you. I mean, is, is ha what's happening between religions at Stanford? And what are the young people thinking? Right. It's a very exciting time, I think, for interfaith relations. We had Ibu Patel on campus last year, who's the head of the Interfaith Youth Corps uh, in Chicago. And we just sent five of our Stanford students to a conference in Chicago with another 600 students, primarily students actually, uh, but other slightly older people like myself. And there is a new interfaith movement in this country that I think may end up being like a civil rights movement. We're so concerned about religious violence and bigotry in the world. The race divide really was the issue of the 20th century. Probably the faith divide is the issue of the 21st century. We began this century with 9-11 in this country, and we need to, to learn how to talk to each other, understand each other, be religiously literate. And listen, listen and to listen. each other. And the critical thing is listening. It's empathetic listening. And so the new interfaith movement is not one trying to look for a lowest common denominator. Instead, it's saying, can I listen to you and understand what it's really like to live as you do? Mm -hmm. See the world through your eyes. Feel what you feel about the things that are most important in your religion. And then will you listen to me mm -hmm. and let me speak <laughs> using eye language, not, you know, I can't believe what you're saying or debating or, or trying to be destructive, but simply listening to the depth of each other's faith. And then hopefully we can learn to work together on common projects. The things we can't work together on, some of the hot button issues of abortion or, mm -hmm. or uh, gay marriage and other issues that divide, but they're issues like the environment that we can get out there and work together between traditions. We all need to, we need clean water and clean air and can be c concerned to work together. We can work together on mm -hmm. disease. Um, and well, I like what you said about if, if there was a group that we're going to get together. It wasn't that you leave your own religion behind. Right. You bring it to the table. Absolutely. But you, to the qualify, you, you had to have been immersed in a tradition and really known about it. So. And the interesting thing about interfaith relations is as people engage deeply in interfaith relations, on the one hand, they're often worried that this will be a new relativism or that they'll be right. converted to some other tradition. But generally what happens is they learn more about their own tradition mm -hmm. because they're challenged 
to say, oh, do we have that kind of meditation in my tradition? Do we, that, do, we do that kind of fasting? Mm -hmm. Do we engage in this kind of social action? Mm -hmm. And when they go back to their own traditions, they usually find the answer is yes. And they also are challenged mm -hmm. as to their doctrine and their dogma mm -hmm. and their holidays <laughs> and all of the things that they do. So they tend to learn more about their own tradition. And after a period of interfaith dialogue, they usually are both stronger in their own tradition mm -hmm. and more open and more literate about others. So yeah. it's really a win-win, I think, for the world and for people's own spirituality. Now, you talked about um, what you thought the burning social issues were, not, not the ones that right. the media focuses on. I mean, the media is always focusing these days on intelligent design or evolution. Yeah. Or the religious right, like you said. Or the religious do, right. Do they ever talk about the liberal Christians? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they're, they're both the, li the religious right and the secular left are constantly harping on what I think are the unimportant issues, I often know. about sexual ethics and uh, about things like evolution, where they take a literalist view of Genesis. The big social issues, the ones that Jesus was concerned about, are wealth and poverty. Mm. That's the issue that Jesus spoke oh. about most directly. Widows and the orphans, poor, the poor, the oppressed, the oppressed Definitely. constantly. Definitely. And he was concerned about war and peace. He, you know, turning the other cheek, how can we yeah. Develop a way of relating yeah. to each other that's humane, that's loving, mm -hmm. etc. Loving kindness and and that goes to yeah to, to bigotry, compassion, compassion, not compassion, compassion, not bigotry, yeah. not being open to other people yeah. regardless of who they are. So those are the big issues mm -hmm. to me, and of, of course modern issues like the environment that we should be paying attention to. We can annihilate ourselves either through the environment or through nuclear weapons these days. And that's where we should be paying attention, yeah. and not to issues that Jesus never actually said a thing about. He never mentioned abortion. He never uh, mentioned mm -hmm. homosexuality. So you can find a few passages about that many passages <laughs> in the Bible that somehow relate to homosexuality, but not to consensual adult yeah. relationships, yeah, right, right. Uh, um, yeah. uh, monogamous relationships. And uh, abortion was something that was, you know, even the Catholic Church it wasn't until the mid-1800s that the current stance on abortion was taken. Right. Because they, there were 40 days, um, they uh, had and different then 116 ideas. days oh, yeah. uh, of, of pregnancy. Quickening. quickening St. Thomas Aquinas had his own ideas. Right. And so so this, these are new ideas, and I, I think it's important to not think these have been in stone for mm -hmm. all of Christian history, and it certainly were not issues that, that Jesus was concerned about. Well, now, you also wrote a few other books. You're very <laughs> prolific, so... Would you like to tell us about those? Sure. When I was at Tufts, I was able to write a book called Finding Your Religion When the Faith You Grew Up With Has Lost Its Meaning. Wow. And that book was really an attempt to speak to people who had freeze-dried their Christianity or their Judaism or whatever the or tradition the young was. People, or no. the college age. Or and college age. But a lot of college age students, I find, have left the religion of their childhood and probably for a number of years haven't done much with the yeah, religion right, at all. Right, right. So I want them to understand that your spirituality, your faith can be grown up along with your intellect, along with your emotional development, your psychosocial development, your cognitive mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. And there's good psychological basis for that. Mm -hmm. There are a number of authors like Jim Fowler and Sharon Parks and Fritz Oser and George Scarlett that have written about faith development and the different stages that we naturally go through in our lives. Oh, yeah, and you, you write about the seven stages in the six, next book. Six, oh, actually. Six. Right, in six, the next yeah. book, right. Well, that, that Finding Your Religion that really lays the, out those. Well, six, and, and I pick up, a, I, I do a short uh -huh. precy of that in this book, too. <laughs> uh, sort of a, a, a primer. But so that was, that was a, an opportunity for me to talk about a lot of stories oh, of okay. tough students and faculty and staff mm -hmm. and friends, but always uh, making sure that their ident identity was protected so that nobody was exposed uh, individually, but talking about a lot of stories of people's religious development mm -hmm. and their understanding of, of God, which is quite different when you think of God personally or when you think of God impersonally, mm -hmm. when you find religious community very valuable mm -hmm. or when you find mm -hmm. you wanting to really back off from mm -hmm churches and clergy and dogma and doctrine and all of that saying I'm spiritual but I'm not religious which is what a lot of our students say. And then the next book? The next book was called Church on Sunday Work on Monday The Challenge of Fusing Christian Values with Business Life. I, I've been a faculty member at the Harvard Business School for about 12 years on a, on a one day a week basis mm -hmm. and now at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford and have been very concerned about business ethics and helping students think about how they can 
develop their character and their moral courage as they go out into their business lives. So that book was co-authored with Laura Nash at the Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. looked at the fact that there's a tremendous divide b between people in business and people in religion, either a lot of disrespect for business, many liberal religionists saying that capitalism um, is immoral, mm -hmm. and a lot of conservative religionists aligning with business, saying the only way you can see if somebody's truly religious and truly faithful is if they're successful. Oh my The gosh. prosperity gospel, saying that the way to demonstrate your uh, godliness is through your worldly success. Oh so we're, we really challenged both of those concepts oh. and oh tried to gosh. help people live out their Christian principles in their business life and gave suggestions on how to do that. Well, I've got I to gotta buy that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we can get all your books at the... They're easy to get. I've seen them all over. So. I hope so. I You're hope pretty so. famous. <laughs> you, you, go, you go to your local bookstore. It's not there, I would say. <laughs> Challenge you that bookstore. <laughs> we only have one minute left. Is there anything profound that you'd like to leave with those watching? And this is your moment, so right. go for it. Well, it's absolutely critical to me that we save this world from the kind of religious violence and bigotry that is so prevalent. And that needs to be done by empathetically listening to people of other traditions, by being able to develop our own religious literacy across traditions, and by wanting to build bridges, not burn bridges, as we relate to each other uh, around the world. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful book. I think I'm going to get it for all my relatives for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that the people watching got a, a, a enlightened view of a Christian liberal <laughs> or a liberal Christian. So thank you. Thank you Reverend very much, Scotty Jane. McLennan. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. And I'm going to finish off with something from his book that we both like that kind of sums it all up. From the hymn Finlandia, it goes, For other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as ours. For other lands have sunlight too and clover, and skies are everywhere as blue as ours. Thank you for joining us. God bless.